You are listening to Be Amplified, the podcast with Brian Thais, episode 55. Hey, Amplifiers, welcome to Be Amplified, the podcast. My name is Thais. And I'm Bree Seeley. We are the co-founders of the Amplify Collective, a movement aimed at radically disrupting how purpose-driven women connect and operate in the world. Because we believe it's not just what you do, but who you are that matters. Each week, join us for messages and interviews that will leave you feeling amplified and ready to change the world. Let's do this. It is Monday morning, and we are here being amplified for all of you. You're being amplified. I'm being sick. Yeah, so Thais is sick today, so we're going to give her a little bit of a pass. And I'm going to have to mute myself every time I want to hack a lung, so don't mind me hacking lungs left and right. I know. Anyway, we're not going to start our podcast in such such a negative energy, Brie. We need to be all about love and light all the time. Tell me, Thais, what is good about this? What is good about you being sick? <laughs> what is the lesson? What is that good I am? about this? Oh my God. I can't gag. I can't. I can't. <laughs> um, anyway, we have Talia on a little bit later, recorded when I wasn't sick. So don't mind the noise. I mean, the voice change. <clears throat> Uh, and she's going to be talking to you about dating. And so Brie and I thought we would start this episode and talk about expectations and talk about dating. Yeah. Brie goes, Tace, what are you going to talk about? <laughs> I've dated <laughs> once in my life. No, maybe, maybe like five times, but you know, I'm sure I can pull some wisdom out from those experiences. Well, Thais has five and I have literally hundreds have you counted like, them have you like written down every at one point I was at one point I was I was keeping track of it all and then it got to the point where like guys I'm eight years single eight <laughs> years single well with a, a short a short boyfriend in there a few short boyfriends in there but for the most part like single for eight years oh yeah what's but, the good in that Brie I will tell you all about the love and light and good lessons there. I will tell you all about it in a hot second. But I'm sure you will. As usual, we want to invite you guys to come kick it with us in person because we love in person and we love hugs and we love our women in Los Angeles. So if you are in LA, we have a dinner party coming up August 1st. We are partnering with Breather, who is an amazing venue uh, space kind of all over the country. They have spaces and their spaces are beautiful. And we're also partnering with Veggie Grill, who is providing us with an amazing menu, salads and wraps and macaroni and cheese and gluten-free goodness and all these things. And of course, the Grand Cortage and Hint Water and all of our favorite things. And we have goodie bags and it's going to be amazing. This is a 21-year-old event plus. Uh, We have the alcohol. Yeah, because of the alcohol, we have gotten some interest, but unfortunately we can't have you if you are younger than 21. So Which doesn't mean we don't love you. We love you. We do love you. We do love you a lot. So grow yeah. up a little bit, grow up a couple years, <laughs> get to that Lego age, and then you can join our events. We're really excited about it. Um, it's coming together very easily. Oh yeah, very beautifully. Uh, so that means it's gonna be epic. Uh, because when Brie and Thais are happy, everyone is happy. Uh, so yeah, so come join us. We're gonna have a good time. Okay, moving on. Now let's dive into Brie's dating life. Nope, just kidding. Ha ha ha. Okay, so let's talk about. Okay, let's talk about the challenges when it comes to dating. Um, the number one being expectation. Um. But there are some other challenges that I feel like really hinders the dating process. And there's also some, there's some bullshit in the dating world about how to get a man. Oh my gosh, there's this meme oh. going around and it's this woman crying hysterically. And um, the, it's an article, it's a link to an article of like, this woman got the, like something along the lines of like, this woman got the worst, the, her worst nightmare came true. And the dating was, I mean, the, the article was about her like being broken up with or whatever and everyone's making fun of it It was like 
Um, there are much more worse nightmares coming true, like being homeless, you know, than being broken up with. But anyway, it is, you know, for many women, being in a relationship and dating is important. And we want to address that in this episode. Yes. Um, I kind of have always likened dating to shopping, which oh, good. I think has been a really helpful thing for me in my dating experience because I know in this expectations topic that um, a lot of times both women and men go into this experience of like, okay, so we are going to meet and then we're going to like each other and then we're going to get to know each other and then we're going to fall in love and then we're going to get married and da, 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 da. Like we just have this idea of how everything's supposed to play out. And for me, I have always considered it like shopping uh, for the most part, the first year, maybe not so much, but after that. And my whole idea about dating is that, you know, when you go shopping, you walk into a store and you look around and you kind of see what's available and you like feel it out and you might grab a few off the rack and like take them back into the, into the dressing room and put them on and see how they look on you. And like, you know, maybe take a selfie and text it to your friend and, you know, maybe choose one or two to take to the register and bring home but oh at my the God. end of the this metaphor day, just keeps going. At the end of the day, you can still return them. Like you can still take them back. Like you're not married <laughs> to the idea of owning this piece of clothing for the rest of your life, right? And so that's something that's really helped me is like going in with this air of curiosity, this air of, you know, what's gonna happen. I always try my expectation of a date is just to have a great conversation. And whether or not that's with someone that turns into a friend or someone that turns into more than a friend, you know, that's kind of up in the air. But as long as I come out of it with a great conversation and back when I was drinking a free glass of wine, you know, like life was good. Um, why is it free, Brie? Huh? Huh? Gender is roles. It- <laughs> not gonna lie <laughs> it's the it's the gender roles that that supports us so we say yes to it it helps us so right. we're fine with that gender role um <laughs> so I have only dated a few times um in my life not out of choice just how my karmic fate has unfolded um <clears throat> while I was uh when I met my current partner Mark um we met day one and we were dating by day three like we were in a quote-unquote relationship like boyfriend girlfriend by day three so we didn't even really have any dates until we started the relationship but I will say that there was something that happened within the month of our relationship that really changed that really scared me that really changed um, my perspective on dating and um, it's this it's this expectation that I had pretty early in the relationship that he was the one and I I felt it like I felt this energy when I first met him like wow there's something here and then within like a a week or so of being together I was like wow he's the one and then within about three weeks of being together I was like what if he's not the one what if he is the one what if he's not the one I remember one particular night we got together we smoked some weed and I got so paranoid I was hoping uh, you would share this story. I wasn't going to bring it up if you didn't, but I was really <laughs> hoping. So thank you. Keep going. I was so paranoid that he was not the one when I had smoked this weed uh, that I wrote notes for myself. Like I left notes for myself on my computer that said, when you wake up in the morning, remember that he is not the one. And uh, so the next day I woke up, I, I didn't forget. I was so paranoid. I obviously remembered the experience. I read the note and I was so scared. I was like, oh my God, he's not the one. What if he is? What if he's not? What if he is? There was so much expectation in the relationship that we got into fights. We barely knew each other. We were already fighting about whether or not he was the one. Now, luckily our relationship is a very, very open. And I was very frank with him that I got that that night that I got, that we got high, you know, I left a note for myself for the morning that he wasn't the one. And he kind of laughed and I had to lean on a couple of my friends who were like, Thais, just because you're paranoid smoking weed doesn't mean that it's your intuition, right? Because that was the fear. What if it's my intuition speaking to me through the weed? And um, I w- we were going to break up. 
because this tension was just ridiculous until I finally had to take a deep breath and sit with myself and say, you know what? I don't know if he's the one or not. I really don't know. And that's not up for me to know three weeks into this relationship. What's for me to know is that we're having a good time, that I like being with him, that he gets me in many ways, and that I want to continue to see where this goes. And um, so two, another month later, so two months after we met and started dating, he moved to Los Angeles and we did two years long distance. And every single day that I've let go of this idea of whether or not he's the one, I've been able and given myself permission to fall more and more in love with him. But that expectation kills us. This idea that we need to know right away in the first date, like the first, the first slide of the Tinder, first picture of the man, we have to know if he's the one. Like that is such incredible burden. We, how are we ever to know in the first date whether or not he's the one? We yeah. don't, we can't know that type of information. We don't know what he's like with his family. We don't know his values, his priority. We don't know what decisions he's made in the past. All we know is this persona that he's presenting to you on the first date. So when you're on a date, stop asking yourself the stupid question of whether or not he's the one. It's a stupid Fact. question. Fact. I'm going to true smack you here. Smacking oh, here. And then this leads me into something that I have been diving into lately. So when I was in Seattle, I reconnected with someone that I started dating eight years ago when I first became single. And I actually have written something for the Huffington Post, which may or may not be being released. I, it's written. It's almost done. Um, but I, I haven't quite decided where it's going or if it's going up yet. And this is the idea that we have this expectation that because we fall in love with someone that they have to be the one. And we have this understanding from movies and society and TV and all these things that because we fall in love with someone, that means that we must be committed and we must get married and like make this a thing. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend this week and she just met someone and she's like, yeah, now like we're trying to figure it out. And I'm like, what if there isn't anything to be figured out? Like, what if, you can just enjoy the experience you're having with this person. What if you can sit in this experience of love and not force it to be anything more than what it is? And so when I reconnected with this person while I was in Seattle, I really got to sit in this experience of deeply, deeply, truly loving someone and remembering that that doesn't mean that there's anything more than that between us. Because this person and I don't have a future together. We are not making any commitments to one another. And that doesn't negate the fact that I can love him completely and fully. And, and I don't need to have any further expectations about it. And so I have really been in this experience of like love does not necessarily equal commitment. And so it kind of ties in with what Thais was saying about how you know, you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to make it the one. You don't have to like force this into something any more than what it is. And I got to spend a day with this man and we had a, a lovely day reconnecting and like being in that place of respect and communion and unity and love and all these things without it being anything more than what it was. Here's the thing. Dating is hard because our hearts are involved. Mm -hmm. And we continue to live in a society that expects women to get married as a definition of her success. And that expectation is really heavy. Um, you know, every time I visit my family in Brazil, the question is, are you dating? You know, who are you with? What is, are you going to marry him? And then of course, the minute we marry, it's when are you going to have children? And we, I'm, my family is not unique. Many families operate. So when we're my family this, does it to my mom too. Like my mom was at some event and my stepdad's family pulled her aside and was like, when is she getting married and moving back to the Midwest so she can start having babies? Yeah. Yeah. So we still very much live under this narrative that we have to get married as a, as a way of determining our success. And so even though we may consciously dismiss that narrative as not being true for us, unconsciously, it's very much there. 
our, our culture has a great way of getting into our heads. And so it's there on some level. And so then, of course, we have this tremendous expectation on every date that we go on. And then we build this person up to be everything that we need it to be, you know? And then uh, we get so disappointed and so heartbroken when it doesn't click and it doesn't match up. Um, I watched this amazing documentary on Netflix called... Really? Uh, yeah, I know. It's called Turned On, Hot Girls Wanted. It's a docu-series. And the second or third episode in the docu-series is about online dating. And it follows this guy who lived in Big Brother, one of those reality TV shows. And he got out of Big Brother and he was a big instant hit. And he loves this attention of women. <clears throat> and he like dates all the time. And the minute he finds one thing wrong with a woman, he breaks up with her and moves on. And um, it's true. When we have this online dating world, it feels like there's so many options and it feels like there's, it's so overwhelming. And then we're looking for the one and then we get our heart broken. What I'm getting at is that we've got to find a way to balance out that energy in our lives by taking really good care of ourselves, surrounding ourselves with good friends, you know, diving into work that we love, you know, of course, being open and curious and exploring the dating scene doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, but being able to find a way to charge your batteries and redefine your worth for when the dating scene gets to be too hard, gets to be too heavy, because it's very, ob it's very obvious to me that when we get rejected again and again and things don't work out again and again, then we tend to make mean things about us. And then again, there, it's devastating. There was a day, I think it was about a year ago, wasn't it? Where I had gone on a great first date and uh, he wanted to see me again. And we had a date set up that night and I was so excited about it. And Thais was over at my place working and he messaged me um, as she was there, as we were working and just said like, Hey, I have to be fully transparent with you. I have been, uh, seeing someone else during this time as well. And, you know, I really am just committed to seeing where it goes from her. And it fucking broke me. Like, thank God Thais was there because I remember curling up on the couch next to her and putting my head in her lap and having her just like, you know, stroke my hair while I cried. And um, it does get really hard. Like it can be so intense and such up and down and roller coasters and exhausting. And, you know, it is, it is hard to not make it be about you. And that's everything in life. It's very hard in entrepreneurship when we get the millionth no. It's very hard for us to not make that mean about us. You know, we take things very personal. We live in a society where everything is very personal because we're not really taught how to not take things personal. Um, and so it's, it's cultivating a skill. And um, I think the best approach at the end of the day for any of this stuff is a lightheartedness and a curiosity, like we said at the very beginning you know, lightheartedness, like not taking this so seriously and being curious about what's coming up. Oh, this worked. Okay. How about this? You know, what's this worked? What about this? Um, and I, you know, I don't really have any opinions on specific dating stuff because what? I haven't dated in, I don't know, four years, but, um, <laughs> I will say that it is surprising to me, um, that people end up do matched up based because the online dating world, tell me if you find this is true, Brie. Okay, here, I'll just ask this as a question. Do you feel like this is true? That because the online dating world is so based on looks, that it, it feels harder to find real connection with people. And the reason why I guess I ask this is because I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that if I were browsing through a dating app that I would have chosen any of my past boyfriend, right? Like, I don't know if by looks only, I may have chosen them to yeah. go on a date with, you know, and, I, and I, how I met them was through offline ways and through personality. So I'm just curious your perspective on that. I don't know if it's necessarily about looks, like, or if that's the reason. I, the thing that I have found more than anything is the overload of choices, mm. that there's always something better out there. So that, you know, you go on a date with a girl and she likes the color pink and you don't like the color pink. And so there's another woman out there that won't like the color pink that matches with you. And so you just don't go on a second date with her. Like it, mm. it, I think the overwhelm of choices 
prevents people from connecting because there's always someone better out there. There's always someone else that you can go on a date with. There's always someone else that's going to quote unquote match better with you. And Mm. because of that, you don't have to show up. Like you don't have to be real. You don't have to face any challenges. You know, the second you go over a road bump with someone, they're like, oh, this is supposed to be easy, not hard. So <gasps> Ooh, I know, we can talk because... about that. Oh, let's talk about that. This idea that it has to be easy. Oh this, my God. Again, I think the dating world is just augmenting what's already in the real world. You know, oh, like true. so true. We, we, in the fitness industry, it's like, if it's not easy, if you're not losing 10 pounds within 10 days and you're doing it wrong, if you're not making six figures in your business within six months, you're doing it wrong. It should be easy, easy, easy. Yes. And then the minute it becomes challenging, it's like, we're going to run. Well, and it's yes. that way with all relationships. I mean, you know, Tyson. The divorce rates. Tyson and I are the first to admit we've been having a ton of ups and downs in our relationship. And, you know, it's about showing up for it. It's about not running away when things are getting tough. It's about committing to communicate when we're having a disagreement. I mean, like it's, it's rampant in our society among everything is the second you have to like actually show up, face shit that's not fun. It's like, oh, okay, I'm out. Oh yeah, Brie, tell me, tell me how that is. (laughs) It no, is. it's true. And it's, I mean, it's even more prevalent, I feel like, in dating because there is always someone else who's going to swipe right on you. There is yeah. always someone else that's going to say yes to a date tomorrow. And it's, it is just, I feel like it's more that than, because, I mean, let's be honest, I know a lot of guys that don't even look at the photos and just swipe right for everyone. <gasps> no. This is what my business coach uh, back in the day used to call the spray and pray method. Where in business, you go to a networking event and you just put your business card fucking everywhere, right? And then you hope that one or two of them calls you. It's the same with dating. Guys swipe right for fucking everyone. And then they hope, and this is just a generalization. This isn't to say it's for everyone. I'm sure women do the same thing. No. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are some women that do that, but I feel like based on women's psychology... That's it's less that's likely. Not, yeah, it's yeah. less likely. Um, but there are, I have heard that there are a lot of guys that do that. And then they just pray that, you know, they'll get three or four women to swipe right on them and then, you know, success. But there's always someone else out there that's willing to say yes to you and go, go out with you. So, and we're not saying that you have to settle uh, by any means. I think what we're saying is it's time for us to change how we approach life. And how we connect with people and And how we connect with people look past the, like the little things, like really, how do you, how do you form a relationship with someone? How do you connect on a soul level? Yeah. Yeah. I think we should have, I think we should interview Mark. I I think it would be a great interview to talk about relationships and and Mark, our Amplify husband, (laughs) my partner come on, but I, yeah, you know, and it's true. Like I could have easily ran from the relationship, you know, when, six weeks in, three weeks in, whenever it was, like I was facing all those doubts. If he's not the one, I could have broken up with him the night that I got high, you know? Um, But I'm learning that running away doesn't solve any problems. And that it's, it's not even that running away solves any problems. Let's be nuanced. There are times when it is important to run away. There are times when it's important for you to, to go. It's not working. It's abusive. It's whatever. We need to go. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about that time when we're trying to find the easy route and we're not really willing to put in the work. Um, yeah, I feel like if we stick around and really force ourselves to show up, we develop a sense of self and a sense of confidence that goes so beyond anything else that I've seen. It's actually really exciting. When you're willing to say, you know what, I want to break up with you right now. Like, I really don't like you right now, but I'm here and I want to talk about this. It, it, it says something to yourself, not even to that person, to yourself about who you are in the world. Um, and that I think is the most exciting thing. Yeah. Now to find someone else that's willing to do the same. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. There's so many times. Like a unicorn. I know he needs, he needs like 10 brothers and sisters or yeah, sure. Sisters too. We've uh, actually joked that I'm like, can Mark just run my, my online? Well, one, I've deleted all of my online dating things. I'm not doing it at all anymore. 
Um, but I've, I've joked that like, can Mark just run my online dating and can he just like pre-screen all the guys and like do all the things. And then like, once all of the initial stuff is done, then he can yep. be like, yes, you're allowed to go on a date with this one. Yep. <laughs> he has to meet the Mark standard of approval first. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're not dating experts. We, we can only share our expertise, but I have a feeling that dating and money and business they all align and how we're showing up in the dating world is probably pretty real to how we're showing up in other areas of our lives. And so it's just another place where we can learn to cultivate patience and self-love and um, self-care and um, compassion. And adventure and curiosity because the thing that I've loved the most about dating is like, one, I have done some shit dirt like on dates that I never would have done on my own I've been slacklining do you know what that is it's almost like um it's almost like tightrope walking yes, except I, the line isn't tight yes I've been slacklining I have been to a fucking monster truck rally on a date That's I so have amazing. like I have done some some stuff that I never would have experienced in the world had I not said yes to a date. Now, did I end up with these guys? No. Does it matter? No. I had these amazing experiences. It's been a really fun ride for me. You know, am I kind of over it? Pretty over it. But, you know, <laughs> it's um it's approaching dating with a curiosity, with an openness, with an excitement of, you know, what you're going to experience without the expectation that it has to turn into love, it has to turn into marriage. I mean, I think that's really the key. Yes, I love it. All right, yeah. let's bring Tali on. Let's do it. All right, Miss Thais, I'm super excited for our guest today. You know, Brie, you always do the miss thing. Like, you really like that miss situation. I don't it's- know if you've noticed that. I feel like it's a sign of respect. I'm just but it's I'm something, showing you respect. So what, once I'm married, you're going to call me Mrs. Thais? Maybe. You'll also be old then too, so. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> really appreciate that. Well, let's introduce our listeners to Talia Goldstein. Talia is the CEO and founder of Three Day Rule. She's been featured on Good Morning America, Fortune, USA Today, Los Angeles Times, and the Huffington Post. While working as a TV producer at E!, True Hollywood Story in 2012, she quickly became the resident dating expert and recognizing her hidden talent began offering matchmaking services and hosting popular singles events. Leveraging her extensive network of successful and attractive singles, Three Day Rule was born. She and her team have since found matches for thousands of clients, including top executives, entrepreneurs, and celebrities, and including one of our Amplify Collective Coterie members. Um, Talia is thrilled that her work allows her to make a difference in people's lives by helping them find true love. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and two children. Welcome, Talia. Thank you. I'm mm-hmm. excited to be here. <laughs> so um, <laughs> tell us, how do you, like, what does it look like for you to live an amplified life? For me, it means really living life to its fullest and living an authentic life. So I am the type of person that will speak openly about my experiences and I do my best to help the people around me grow. So I think living an authentic life, living a big life, I never want to look back in 40 years and feel like I missed opportunities. So I'm really taking advantage of every day. Yeah. So, okay. So the word authentic gets thrown around all the time. It's become like this cliche word and I love, I love the word authentic, uh, but people use it all the time. So what does that mean? Like what, what does authentic mm-hmm. living really look like? Well, I can give you an example that I see over and over. I speak a lot at panels, specifically tech panels. And a lot of people get up in front and they sugarcoat their story and they make it seem like it was much easier than it actually was. And I don't do that. So I think that it's really important to be open about your experiences, call it like it is, be truthful, because that's the only way that you can grow as a person and you can help other people grow. They truly know what it's like to be in your shoes. 
So I do that every day with the people that I work with and with my family. And when I'm speaking on panels, I think you just have to, you know, call it like it is and actually explain what's going on at any given time. This is a perfect segue. I was going to ask you because I know that there's a particular story um, that you have talked about a little bit regarding when you were going for funding for Three Day Rule and some of the challenges and struggles that you faced in that process. So can you share with us what it was like to be a pregnant woman while, you know, up in Silicon Valley finding the funding for Three Day Rule? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I've actually been lucky enough to fundraise pregnant twice. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I also seem to have bad timing. (laughs) So the, the first time that I raise money. We were raising our seed round. I found out I was pregnant and I had read a blog by a prolific angel investor that I admired and I still admire to this day, but he wrote a blog that basically said he would not be interested in investing in a pregnant CEO. And once I read that, I started to worry because this is the first time I was raising money And I had a feeling my pregnancy would hurt us. So I started calling some of our advisors. And without telling them I was pregnant, I asked, would you invest in a pregnant CEO? And they all said no. They felt it would be a red flag. Wow. And so then I really felt that I had to hide this pregnancy. And I did not even tell my business partner at the time. I was so, I didn't want her to walk into a room and feel nervous. So I kept it to myself. It was about 80 degrees. I was wearing trench coats and big ponchos, but I didn't want anybody to know. And once I felt that I was growing too big where I couldn't hide it, I ended up telling my business partner and we closed the round and everything actually ended up working out in that round. Then a few years later, we went to raise another round and something actually happened in the company where we weren't planning to raise, but then a deal didn't go through. And so we had to raise again. And Again, I was three months pregnant and I had grown as a person and the company had grown. And so I thought, I am not going to hide it this time. I'm really going to own it. We have the metrics to back everything up as a company and it's unfair for women to have to hide their pregnancy and we really need to have role models. So I decided I'm going to own, I'm going to wear really tight dresses and I'm going to go full force (laughs) and we'll see what happens. And I did. And it was really difficult. I took a lot of meetings and a lot of the investors would ask questions about the baby. Some of them said, well, why don't you have the baby and we'll talk after. And so while I was raising, we didn't raise (laughs) any money. And I had the baby. And about two days later, I had to come back to work to take meetings because we really needed to close our round. And right away, we closed nine investors. So it was almost as if the sight of a pregnant lady really scared the investors. But then once the baby was out, they were willing to invest. Wow. That so we like, I would around. be more disgusted with the world than you are sharing <laughs> the <this> story. <laughs> it's tricky because I understand their perspective as well. You know, it is a risk. You don't necessarily know whether someone's going to love their baby so much and never want to work again, or maybe something will happen. So I understand the risk. But what I've realized is that a determined woman is unstoppable. And if somebody is fundraising pregnant or has, you know, created a startup that they absolutely feel passionate about, those are the people that you need to get behind and not be concerned about what happens after the baby. See, this is the thing. This is the thing about being, you know, uh, un- un- like being the underdogs. Women are the underdogs in our society is that we, mu- we have to understand the other side. We have to. But we, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that it's fair. That doesn't mean that it's right. That doesn't mean that we should honor it just because we know what the other side is thinking. You know, I talk to a lot of my friends who you know, are people of color and they share the same thing. Like they know how to take care of white people's hair. They don't want to know, but they know because that's all our society tells them. 
but that doesn't mean that it's fair. That doesn't mean that they should, you know, be fired from their jobs because they want to wear their hair naturally as opposed to press. Anyway, so it just, I'm just mm -hmm. getting frustrated for you just listening to <laughs> the story and I just kind of want to tell those investors where to shove it uh, <laughs> because that's, mm, mm, mm. It's really tricky, but I think the way to move forward is to have more people that believe in women and invest because right now we have very few role models. And so we need to get more role models. And once we have people that have gone through the process and raised money while pregnant, then I think more and more people will, can get behind it. Right now, there's really, there aren't very many people to look up to. Well, and I think part of the problem too, and you know, we've had Vicki Saunders on talking about funding and also Tanya Faulkner and like, there's no women angel investors, which no. I think is part of the problem. And I <clears throat> actually, I'm curious to know, like when you called your board of advisors, are they all male or are any of them women that said that they wouldn't mm -hmm. end up pregnant? It's a great question. I have never pitched to a female. Well, I, that's not true. In this round, I did not pitch to a female investor. And my advisors that I called were all male. Wow. So I don't, I don't, it maybe it would have been different had I pitched to female investors. I don't know. And I will say, you know, these investors are good people. I love working with them. So, well, they're just a victim to you this. Know, like I said, as well. I, you know, we're not, we're not right, blaming exactly. the people, we're blaming yeah. the system. We're, we're, we're talking about a systematic, systematic issue where women are being underrepresented and are not being supported in, in raising money for their businesses. Right, exactly. And I think it's interesting too, because they said it was a risk. And I mean, let's be real. Like if you're an angel investor, every dollar you spend is a risk. Mm -hmm. Like, so what makes a pregnant woman more of a risk? than just like a normal tech startup that's like every other tech startup out there. Right. I, I know. I mean, that's, I mean, not that my husband would never that. have gotten questions that, that I got and it, women should be able to take time off. I'm not really not advocating for what I went through, but I didn't even take a day off. I had a baby. I was back at work the next day taking these fundraising meetings and my husband took a month off. So I don't think mm. you can really, you know, go by gender rules. It's, I had a company that I created that I'm obsessed with. I will do anything for. And some of the investors that asked me about, um, or they asked, you know, this is going to be your, your baby and let's just see how that goes. Well, my response is I have 40 other babies that I care for at my company that I also have to take care of. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not going to neglect those babies just for my other child. Yeah. So I really hope that more and more women go through this process so that we can have role models because my fear is that women won't choose to have startups because they'll opt to have a family. I don't right. think they're mutually exclusive. And I want to have more role models for young women who could potentially be great entrepreneurs. Yeah. So where, so let's talk about that kind of role model. Like where do we start in creating more incentives for women in business? I think investors have to get behind women. I'm so glad that more, there are more female investors out there. I think that's definitely going to help. And I've seen a really big change from the time I started in tech till now, there are so many more women. So I think that that helps yeah. the chances of having more role models because we have more women. When I started, it was me and my business partner and 400 men. And now at every event, it's about a third women. So I do think we're making a lot of progress, which is exciting. That's amazing. I love, I love hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about this, uh, this other baby of yours that you're obsessed with. Um, so what was it about dating that really made you super excited and, you know, being obsessed with this whole idea of three-day rule? Well, I was working in TV at E! Entertainment and 
people would just come up to me and ask for advice. And I loved giving advice. And I wanted to know every single detail about them. And I really loved learning about people. So I would match somebody successfully. And then the next day, somebody else would come up and they wanted to tell their story. And so it happened really organically. I was just setting people up in my department and then other departments were coming by. So I started to host singles events around town and very quickly they became popular. We had within a few months, 600 people at these huge hotels. Wow. And it was at one of the events where I took a step back and I looked in at the crowd and noticed that these people should be finding love. They're pretty incredible. And they're was only match and eHarmony at the time and then these million dollar matchmakers. So I thought there's something missing in the middle. I'm going to take a leap of faith, quit my job and start a matchmaking company. I really have never looked back. It's evolved a lot over the last few years, but I truly am obsessed with matchmaking. And I know that we're really serving a purpose. There are a lot of apps that have come out over the last few years, and I am an advocate of online dating and the apps. I'm, I'm grateful that they came out, but it also creates more of a headache. The average online dater is spending 13 hours a week online, so there are endless options. People aren't focusing, so it's brought some um, challenges to dating, and so people are turning to matchmakers to help guide them through the process and also, in a sense, to outsource their love life so they can focus on other things. So what makes this so much different from, you know, the millionaire matchmakers? Like, how, how do your, um, not customers, but how do your employees kind of go about the process differently to make it easier for people? Because personally, like, I've online dated a ton. Like, I've been online dating for the last eight years and I can sit here and tell you how much I hate it. Um, but like, what, you know, what, what do they look at differently from a typical online dating platform? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll talk about the process a little bit, and then I can give you some more insight into that. So let's say you are interested in becoming a client. You sign up online, you take a two minute quiz, and you're assigned a matchmaker. And the matchmaker will reach out to you and set up a meeting in person. So we meet everybody in person, the clients and the matches. And we'll get to know you. We ask a lot of questions <clears throat> about your dating history, your goals, what you're really looking for in life. And we walk away with a sense of who we think you should be matched with. And from there, we go back to our database and we come up with a group of people that we think could be great matches for you. And we go and meet them in person as well. And we ask them very similar questions to the questions that we asked you. And once we have somebody that we think could be a great match, we'll set you up on a date. And after the date, you both give us feedback. And that's really helpful. One, because there's a lot of miscommunication in dating. People might think the other person wasn't interested and then they won't call. And so that really helps us to make sure everyone's on the same page. But also it helps you as a dater. So we will find trends. Perhaps you're coming off too eager or you're asking interview questions. There's some things that you might be doing in dating. And there are reason, you know, there might be a reason why you're not landing a second date or a third date. Well, we get that information and we can work with you on it. So as a client, you get matchmaking, coaching. We do a photography session with you. And ideally, you walk away with the love of your life. But at the very least, you're learning about yourself and you're walking away a more confident dater. And so some of the trends that I've noticed, I would say the biggest trend is that we find your person will probably come in a different package than you're expecting. I think the best thing you can do in dating is to be really open-minded. And when you're doing the apps, you're really narrowing your filters. You might say over six feet tall or with a certain degree or certain ethnicity, and you're really narrowing the pool. But I think the best strategy is to be open-minded and really open to possibilities. Yeah, where and I can that, give you countless examples of times that we've matched people. Where does that balance come in? Because like, of course, we all have preferences or we have, you know, I have a, a type or whatever, you know, quote unquote type. Um, so how, like, what do you do to get people past that? Like if some, if you send someone mm -hmm. a profile and say, oh, this person like is a really great fit for you. 
do you have to like poke and prod them to get them to say yes and actually trust you even though it looks different than what they expected? Some people, it is a process, but for the most part, people come to us because something's not working and they really want an expert opinion. And so we do it together. We'll say, you know, I have a match for you. He's not exactly what you're looking for. I think here are the qualities that he has that you've expressed you're interested in. And here are some things that he has that you have not expressed you're expressed that you're interested in. But I feel that it could be a match and the client will typically trust us and go on the date. And after they're pleasantly surprised and they're so grateful that they went on the date. So this is definitely a process. We'll set you up with someone and then you might come back and say, look, I really liked him, but he wasn't funny enough. And so we'll iterate for the next match and eventually we'll get you to where you need to be. And I've seen it work over and over again. And so many of my success stories, they came to me and said, I want X, Y, and Z. And I matched them with something almost the opposite and they got married. So I, I think, you know, when you're working with a matcher, you really just have to trust the matching are because sometimes it takes a stranger to see things that you're not seeing. Right. So say one of our listeners is listening right now and they want to kind of open up into a more expanded version of dating, but they're not at a place to like call you. What is like one or two tips that you would give to someone who's on the journey of dating to help them kind of expand their world a little bit? Mm -hmm. I definitely think you should open up your filters online. So if you are narrowing by certain factors, height, as an example, open it up. If you're, if you're open to this, I would open different ethnicities and start swiping right on people maybe you wouldn't normally be interested in and just go on a date and see. I think also in real life, first of all, most people are heads down in their phone. And so I always give the advice to look up and talk to people. So in the real world, to start talking to random people when you're in line at Starbucks or after a yoga class, because you might click with somebody who you physically are not, would not have swiped right on. Awesome. And then um, I had another one too from my dating experience. Oh, so you get matched, like online dating, you get matched with all these people, right? And like you said, everyone's mm-hmm. head down in their phones and everyone's so preoccupied with being so busy in our lives right now, right? Like, it's almost like a status right. symbol that like, look at how busy I am. It means I'm important. And so you get all these matches and then the conversations just kind of don't go anywhere. Like, it, are there any tips that you have about maybe making a connection with someone via text so that it turns into dating or a a Mm -hmm. date or anything in that regard? I have a major tip that actually of all my tips, I think is the best one. Women have to be proactive. I think that guys have become very lazy, especially with all the technology and they don't make as much of an effort anymore in person and online. So I think women have to be proactive. If you see somebody at an event, you go talk to him. If you see somebody online, you send the first message and you do whatever you can to land the first date. After you get the first date, you go back to being traditional, but I've, it works. So I think, you know, email, send an email, try not to chit chat for too long, see if they're available on Wednesday night to grab a drink, go out and then go back to being traditional. Fascinating. That's definitely something I struggle with because I'm like, I'm very traditional. And so I am always like, you know, I want him to ask me out. That's like a thing. (laughs) Yeah, you that if you learn anything from this, it's that cannot be a thing. I mean, it definitely works. There are some gentlemen out there that are going to reach out to you. But for the most part, they are lazy. So don't get it out of your head that this is how it's supposed to be and just reach out. And as a, another example, I did this with my husband. I walked into a party. I saw him across the room. He's a shy guy and he was with his friends and there's absolutely no way he would have approached me. But I told the person next to me, you go grab that guy and bring him over here right now. And he did. My husband had no idea what was happening. He brought him over. I said, hi, I'm Talia. It's nice to meet you. We had a few minute conversation. He got my number and that's it. Now we have two kids. So I've, I've seen it work with 
many of my clients and it worked with me. So I think girls should get in the habit of being proactive. That is a great tip. But what no. about what? Wait, but what about shit. the whole thing that we've been learning for the past three million years? That men like the scream, <laughs> men like the game, and you have to play hard to get. And like, what what happens with that? <laughs> so I think when it's right, it's easy, and you don't have to play games. But we're only talking about the first date, you know, to be flirty and. And cute and say, oh, I'd, you know, if you have something in common, oh, we should go to that concert sometime or I'd love to grab a drink just to get the first date. And then if you want to be coy, you want to play a little hard to get after you can. But the truth is when you find someone that is right for you, it's easy and you're comfortable and you don't really have to play those games. Mm. Thais, didn't, you didn't play games with Mark, did you? Uh, no. I just, I was sitting next to him at a conference and I leaned over and I said, I know this is really inappropriate, but I can't, you know, I, I can't stop wanting to touch you. Like we would play like the games where we would like put my hand just in the right place so that like his knee has to touch it. And he, I could tell that he was <laughs> doing it too. Anyway, and then the very next break that we had, he, you know, he responds. He was like, yes, me too. And then the next little break that we had, he just leans over and kisses me. And we've been kissing ever since. <laughs> I love it. Well, you're an active participant, so that's great. Yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess so. I guess I'm an active participant, Bree. Maybe you can learn from me. I know. You need to teach me all your ways. <laughs> I got to teach you my ways. Well, it's radically uncomfortable, but we were at like a self-development thing, and I just, she was talking about fucking carpe diem or whatever the fuck you talk about these things, and I just had to do it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's great. One client that we were working with recently, she goes to a lot of conferences and I asked, have you ever met a guy at one of these conferences? And she hadn't. And so she, we're working with her on being more open and flirty. Even if you are in a work environment, there's still an opportunity to meet somebody, maybe not in your own office. That can be tricky, but when you're going to these larger conferences, you know, it's, you're not you know, you can, it could be multi-purpose. Totally. Yeah. I have been asking everyone I meet lately, that's like in partnership, not everyone, but like the people that I get to know a little bit, asking them how they met their significant other, uh, in order to help me expand my understanding or perception of like what's possible for me. So I've been like asking everyone what their, their meeting story was just to like, yeah, help myself with, with the stories that I tell myself about how it can and can't happen for my, for me. I'm guessing that most of them didn't feel crazy sparks on the first date. Is that true? Um, a lot of the people I've talked to have had really kind of serendipitous meeting things like Thais, you know, like her and Mark sitting next to each other and just like feeling drawn to one another or, um, another woman I know met this guy at this random thing and then they spent a year kind of like looking for each other but they never really connected and then they ended up at the same festival and ran into each other and so a lot of the people I know have had really serendipitous meetings oh that's so sweet but, but let's talk about that because there is this divide too of like well you should give him a chance versus like I didn't have any chemistry with, you know, so like I was seeing a guy in this fall and we were on like probably our sixth or seventh date. And I reached down and grabbed his hand for the first time. We were crossing the street and we were holding hands for the first time. And instantaneously upon grabbing his hand, I had this, like, this isn't it. And I was mm. just talking to a girlfriend about it a few weeks ago, actually. And she was like, well, you should have given him a chance. Like that stuff can grow. So what do you say to people who have this, like, I, I know that this doesn't feel right versus like it, it can grow on you? Mm -hmm. Well, I, a lot of people come to me and they say, I'm meeting these people. I'm just not feeling these crazy sparks on the first date. And I think we have a lot of fairy tales and, you know, movies about that. And so that's what they're expecting. But what I found is it can grow. So 
if you go on a date with somebody and you find them remotely attractive and they're interesting and kind, it is definitely worth a shot to go on a second date or a third date. So you're at the sixth date and I think you did give it a fair shot. So maybe you could have given it one, one more, but a lot of people don't even give it a second date. But I think it's really important to give somebody a second or third or fourth date because people are nervous or they're tired. They can't come out of their shell right away. And so I do think there are a lot of missed opportunities because people feel they're supposed to be sparks from day one. So Talia, what's your favorite story? Like, do you have a favorite story of clients or maybe from your early days when you were just hooking up coworkers or anything? I have a few. The favorite stories are the ones that came to me and they wanted something totally different from who I match them with. The one example I had this girl, she grew up in Orange County and she was very proper and wanted a corporate finance guy. But I could tell that deep down she had an edge. She was into cool music and there was something about her that made me feel that the corporate guy wasn't going to be her type. And so I had this guy who was a rocker covered in tattoos with long hair and I said I think he could be great but I want to let you know what this is going to look like you're not going to go on fancy dinners you're going to instead go to concerts and I kind of laid it out for her and she said you know what I'm up for an adventure let's try it and it worked out they got married and they just had a baby so those are the examples that I love because I feel without three-day rule then perhaps these clients wouldn't have met their soulmates. So wait, how do you know? Like how, what is it that you, how do you work your magic to know that what she's saying isn't actually what she's saying? You know? Mm -hmm. A lot of times I just read between the lines. So they'll, they talk for 45 minutes or an hour and I write trigger words. And so when I look down at my paper and I see all these trigger words that lead me to believe that we should try a different type hard to explain the process, but that's what goes on in my head. As they're talking, I'm writing trigger words and I'm writing potential matches for them. And then I'll go back and think about it a little bit more. And then we obviously meet everybody in person to make sure. But in that, in that instance, I could just tell that she, there was more to her than what she was describing. And I know just from work, doing this for so long that there's a difference between what people want and what they need. And so I listen to what they need a little bit more. Interesting. Well, and I think that that's also, I mean, that's my relationship with Mark, you know, like he wasn't my quote unquote type, you know, he, you know, I had a, a list of things that I wanted in a person and while he matched many of them, he didn't match all of them. And um, Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I guess I'm fortunate to not have to do online dating. I don't know if that's fortunate or unfortunate. I don't know, you know, but I, I see how painful it can be to expect to know by one person's picture, whether or not that person is worth of your time. I feel like there's so, again, with that pressure that this, you know, that you'll get to know all about them through a few exchanges. And if they don't have, they're not funny enough through the initial texts, then it just gets, you know, we, we read into that. And it seems like it's very challenging for women who, you know, want to find their partner. Right. And it's especially challenging for women who have these long lists. So we work with <laughs> men and women. Men come to us with three things they want. Almost every guy wants the same. And women come to us with a list of 75 things. They Wait, want broad what shoulders. Are the things? Oh. Men want someone they're attracted to, someone warm and nurturing, and someone passionate about something. And they don't care what that is. It could be their career. It could be yoga. It could be yeah. animals. They want them to be passionate about something. And most guys we work with ask for those three things. Fascinating. And then women ask for 75 things. They want, <laughs> you know, them to make a certain amount of money and come from a great school and have broad shoulders and perfect teeth. And, you know, does it really matter in 70 years if the person you're with has broad shoulders? No. But what really matters is that they're loyal and supportive. So we have to work with these women to narrow down their list to, you know, maybe the five or six things that truly are important in the long long run. How do you think we start switching out of that? 
Like, what do you think it is to get women to be looking past the bullshit rom-coms that dominate our fucking society and our, you know, silver screens and all that stuff? Like, how do we look past that shit and start focusing on what really matters? You should definitely work with a matchmaker. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good question. I I have to think about that more. I I think, you know, if, if you see more and more couples that don't look exactly how you would imagine and they seem happy and perhaps it opens your mind. I think also now people the couples are looking different. You know, some people are not getting married. Some people are having a child first. And I think that actually helps because it breaks stereotypes and it opens people's minds to different possibilities. And to figure out what do they truly want? What do you really want your relationship to look like? You know, maybe you do only care about looks and money and you don't really need to dig deep in a relationship or Maybe it, that is part is really important to you and you're willing to forego the perfect looking guy so you can have a real connection, somebody that you want to travel with. Yeah. Some, it's figuring out what, what is truly important to you. I think that is, comes from inside and you have to be self-aware about what you envision your relationship to be like, not look like, but to be like. One combination that I see work really well is I say that there's one rock and one star and a lot of times stars are looking for another star when in reality they should be with a rock oh my god that's that rock I'm the star oh this (laughs) puts everything in my life into perspective (laughs) I'm so glad (laughs) I'm telling Mark that he's not the star I I'm sure okay with it he's such a rock that he's okay being a rock (laughs) <laughs> I, I really like that analogy and then together you're a rock star right I actually have never thought about that that's genius <laughs> <laughs> or you're together you're rock stars plural so you make I'm yeah. definitely stealing that oh, it's that's all yours Talia is going to change all of our marketing all of me <laughs> hashtag, hashtag recently Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We have never had a dating expert on the show. And as much as Thais gets uh, annoyed with me bringing up dating on the show, I think this has been a really great interview. Great. Hopefully you learned something. <laughs> and you can sign up for 3 roll. Actually, I think I was interviewed by one of your people. Like not, I didn't pay, but just like in your system. Yours. What city are you in? L.A. I'm going to go look it up right now. <laughs> I'm going to do it right now. Go look up all Bree's neuroses and craziness. That's so yes, funny. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Well, you have my email. So if you find someone, by all means, you know how to reach out to me. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, I'm going to do that right now. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, well, one last thing for all of our listeners. Yes. How can they find you? Is there... Are you on socials? How do they find a three-day rule? We're on social. All of the handles is three, are the three-day rule. And to sign up, you just go to threedayrule.com. Awesome. And you have to write it out, T-H-R-E-E, because three with the number is an 80s band. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Now I'm going to go check that out. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Talia. This has been so much fun. And like I said, one of our Amplify women uh, is currently has a, is working with you guys and has had some amazing, amazing dates. She has told me all about them and loves working with your people. So. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. And for those of you that are listening, you can find us as usual at the Amplify Co. on all the socials. Instagram is our favorite, but we are also on Facebook and Twitter. And until next week, go be amplified. Woo! Woo!